Praise the Lord and welcome to our weekly 30-minute podcast, The Elephant in the Room with Bishop Michael Bellamy. Our podcast will cover various topics that are often overlooked, misunderstood, or even controversial from a biblical perspective. We're blessed to have a team of wonderful producers who want to make each episode something that will be enjoyable and informative. During the month of August, our producers have put together great episodes that will cover a wide range of topics surrounding the beginning of the new school year for elementary, secondary, and post-secondary students. In today's episode, we will discuss the importance of parents and guardians stepping into their roles and callings as their children's first teachers, as their K-12 through children head back to school this August and September. Today's podcast was produced by Associate Pastor Corey Linda Bellamy Sr. It was edited by Lady Satoya Clanton and Sister Tynika Harris Coronado. I'll be right back with today's episode. King Solomon of Israel said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 1, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Many of our children and grandchildren have been on summer break for the last two or three months. We have implemented schedules and programs like vacation Bible school, summer school, camps, and vacations for our children with an objective to keep them involved, occupied, and steadily engaged in learning. Well, the best laid schemes, O oh men and mice, gang apt ugly. That is a quote adapted from a line in To a Mouse by Robert Burns. It means no matter how carefully something is planned, something may go wrong. After a few weeks of marching to the beat of the drummer, things went awry. Getting up early evolved into sleeping late. Summer programs were exchanged for PS5. Nintendo Switch, and PlayStation. The laundry piled up. The pantry was empty. You probably couldn't keep the refrigerator stocked. And your household budgets experienced the summer drought. We have had enough. It is time. What time, you may ask? Back to school season. Yes, it is that time already. August is here and our children are headed back to the classroom. Praise God. Hallelujah. It is time for us parents and guardians to get our children up, get them ready, give them a lunch and a snack and send them off to be educated and babysit by the U.S. Department of Education, State and local school systems because we've had enough. But, as believers, we absolutely must take the responsibility of setting the tone for both secular and spiritual education within our families. And that, my friend, is the elephant in the room. The primary responsibility of teaching children belongs to us, the parents and guardians. Other institutions such as the school system, our churches, and local community centers are all secondary. We appreciate the opportunity for formal education. Our tax dollars build the infrastructure and hire the administrators, educators, and staff to give our children good instruction. Many other citizens in other countries, especially young girls and women, do not have this luxury of easy access to education. Psalms 127, verse 3 to 5, I'll read it from the contemporary English version, says, Children are a blessing and a gift from the Lord. Having a lot of children to take care of you in your old age is like a warrior with a lot of arrows. The more you have, the better off you will be because they will protect you when your enemies attack you in court. The word also says in Proverbs 22 and 6, I'll read it from the message version. 
Young people are prone to foolishness and fads. The cure comes through tough-minded discipline. The New King James Version of this scripture reads, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. To put it plainly, God has entrusted parents and guardians with loving, providing for, and giving godly instruction and discipline to his heritage, our children. We are required to handle the gift of children seriously as followers of Christ. As we send our children back to school this August and September, we must intentionally equip ourselves to give them the tools they need to have a successful school year. Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30 reads, For who among you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost to see whether he has resources to complete it? Otherwise, perhaps, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to complete it, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to complete it. Much like how we are as adults prepare for our work days, we must also help our children prepare for each day of the school year. School teachers have begun emailing parents a supply list appropriate for each grade level. The list may be divided into two sections, must-haves and wish lists. The must-haves may include binders, dividers, paper, notebooks, pencils, pens, markers, etc. Secondly, the wish list may request hand sanitizers, Ziploc bags, Clorox wipes, paper towels, dry erase markers, and other classroom essentials and luxuries. Some school districts require parents to purchase a tablet or laptop for instruction. Other districts may make them available for free or for a small fee. Next, we want our children to step out of the house or apartment dressed for success. We purchase new or gently used clothing. The shoes are on point and the hairstyle that is on fleek, as the young people say. <laughs> Just as in the workplace, dressing well in the schoolhouse will strongly increase self-confidence and the impression others have toward our offspring. While we don't want to think this, the results of their teachers' positive perceptions of our children's appearance may increase their grade. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, and I'm reading from the New International Version, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. We must keep this scripture in mind when we decide where we send our children to school. Recently, a random woman posted a social media that she was available to provide child care free of charge to parents. This post was alarming. Who is this person? What licensing or certifications does she have? Where is she located? Where are her references? Does she have a criminal background? Does she have a reputable business? As parents and guardians, we should always ask ourselves, who is best qualified to provide my child or children with the best education? One that reflects my religious beliefs will equip them with the academic skills to succeed and give them the ability to communicate and socialize with people of all persuasions. Here are four school choices for your consideration. Number one, homeschool. John Holt, an education theorist, encouraged parents to homeschool children in a rich and stimulating learning environment where they could learn 
what they are ready to learn when they are ready to learn it. Holt theorized that children engaged in rote, that is mechanical or habitual repetition, learning to avoid punishment and ridicule from educators instead of understanding and retaining a subject matter. Holt noticed that children disengaged from acquiring knowledge and only wanted to please their teachers and parents. According to Homeschooled Bosses 2021 article titled How John Holt Started an Education Revolution, John Locke, author of Zyger the Tiger Stories, wrote in the article, 10 Benefits of Homeschooling You Need to Know. Here they are. Homeschoolers do better on test. They have more emotional freedom. There is no homework. They are not socially isolated. Flexible schedules make life easier for the whole family. They can learn at their own pace and make faster progress. Their special needs are catered for. There is plenty of time for premium parenting. Homeschoolers may become happier and more productive adults. They may be more independent. Here's the second one. Private school. Homeschooling is not for every parent and child. It may not be your calling. Consider a private school. The biggest difference between private school and public school is that there are more enhanced opportunities like extracurriculum activities and courses and programs for gifted students. Secondly, the teacher to student racial is better than public schools. Educators have more time per student, which increases students' grades. Third, they may be safer. Smaller classroom size gives educators more control to limit chaos and disruption. Fourth, private schools require more parent participation. Fifth, Wealthier parents can afford to pay high fees that provide stable resources for teaching professionals, well-equipped classrooms, facilities, and much more. The third option is public school. In her article titled, 10 Advantages to Public Education, Grace Chen identified costs as the first reason public schools are the better option. Every family cannot or does not want to pay tens of thousands of dollars for private school. The primary funding comes from the government with some supplemental fundraising from parents. Public schools are required to provide an equal education available to the community. Public schools are also more diverse Students receive more exposure to peers from different cultures, economic levels, and disabilities. Studies have found that public school students' test scores are comparable to their private school counterparts when apples are compared to apples. Class sizes start out smaller and may increase by grade as your child becomes more independent. Gifted and talented students have advanced opportunities to attend advanced placement, performance arts, and technology classes. Please note that students struggling academically may get left behind based on the schools they attend. As our children's first advocates, it is important for us to recognize when they are having trouble learning reach out to their teachers sooner than later to discuss possible options for additional learning support opportunities such as response to intervention or RTI for math and reading. If funding is available, students have an opportunity to participate in extracurriculum activities once the bell rings. Qualifying students may receive services such as free or reduced lunch, transportation, and academic assistance. 
Public school teachers must have a state certification. Continuing education credits and periodic renewal is also necessary to maintain certification. Public schools are also accountable to their State Department of Education to ensure they are managed properly to avoid failure. And then there is the fourth option of charter schools. In her article, What Are Charter Schools? Ariana Protheo described charter schools as a tuition-free school of choice that is publicly funded but independently run. In her article, she wrote the following. In exchange for exemptions from many of the state laws and regulations that govern traditional public schools, charters are bound to the terms of a contract or charter that lays out a school's missions, academic goals, fiscal guidelines, and accountability requirements. On the other side of a charter contract is an authorizer, such as a state agency, a university, or school district, depending on the state, that has the power to shut down charter schools that do not meet the terms of their contracts. Prothro shared some pros and cons of charter schools that parents and guardians should be aware of when choosing this type of school. Here are the pros. Charter schools spur school and classroom innovations and offer parents and guardians more educational options. Leading schools to compete to attract and retain students which leads all schools to improve. According to Stanford University Center for Research on Educational Outcomes, in some national regions, charter schools outperform traditional public schools in reading and are rated equally in math, particularly in urban areas. Researchers at Clemens University and the University of Alabama at Birmingham concluded that students with disabilities in general, get better academically in charter schools than in district schools. Now, let's talk about some of the cons. Charter schools managed by for-profit organizations have been subject to financial mismanagement to nepotism. Those who oppose charter schools argue that they divert vital resources from cash-strapped school districts They educate proportionately fewer students with disabilities. They cherry pick students. They rely on punitive discipline practices and they are more racially segregated than their traditional public school counterparts. The researchers at Clemens University also found that students with disabilities, students in both sectors, public and charter schools, do worse than their non-disabled peers. Whether our children attend homeschool, private school, public school, or public charter schools, we need to be alert and aware to determine our children's academic and social needs. This is Bishop Michael Bellamy. I hope you enjoy our podcast and will subscribe to our Facebook page, You will find our weekly 30-minute episodes on many of your favorite platforms. Would you please tell your family and friends to listen as well? We would also love to hear from you. Feel free to connect with us on Facebook and via email at theelephant2022 at gmail.com. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, I'm reading from the King James Version, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we have learned anything over the last two years during the pandemic shutdown and rolling schedules, it is most parents are out of touch with homework assignments. Even simple math has become complicated because the techniques have changed over the years. It is not enough to get the problem solved. You must know how to 
resolve how it was resolved using current learning trends. In being our children's first teachers, it's important to know when to ask for help. We can reach out to our children's teachers to get clarity on home on homework assignments. We ourselves don't understand. We should also consider having our children ask their teachers for additional assistance before their classes begin during lunchtime or study hall if available. Some teachers even offer after school tutoring labs. Students can take advantage of doing the weeks and even the weekends. Another opportunity is educational apps. Parents, guardians, and students may sign into an app and get refreshers on tough subjects, additional information to support their children's learning at home, or learn new concepts to keep up with what their children are learning. Our churches are also great reservoirs of academic resources. There are other students who have knowledge and application skills. Perhaps your church has members who are also teachers or other educational professionals who are available to tutor in their free time. At a minimum, someone can spare in-person or online resources that are available for free or cost efficient. The word tells us in 1 Peter Chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, I'm reading from the King James Version. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. As the protectors of all children, the best way to advocate for our pupils is to stay connected. We have heard the saying, out of sight, out of mind. If we are not active in our children's education, they may not get a much positive attention needed to be successful. Here are a few suggestions. Attend and actively support school activities. Attend all the parent-teacher's meetings. Talk with your child or children daily to help you be aware of their triumphs and challenges on an ongoing basis. Quickly schedule a meeting with their teachers if issues arise. Talk with their teachers about any issues related to the child that may affect his or her school performance. Get involved in parent organizations, school advisory councils, or committees, and vote for officials who share your religious, educational, and political views in school board elections. Let me give you an example of how to advocate for your child. A parent who was actively involved in their child's education received a message from her daughter's school teacher. The teacher informed the mother that there was a situation that needed her attention. Clearly, the child had been having a bad morning. Rather than encouraging the middle schooler to take a few minutes to hit the reset button, the first period teacher sent an email to all other teachers warning them that an angry child was headed their way. Unknown to the child, the teacher was also having a difficult morning. Agitating the child and involving others was not helpful. The child's mother was able to connect with the teacher to intervene and offer positive corrective measures that the teacher was able to put into place, which resulted in a better day for their child. Luke chapter 21 verse number 11 reads, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilence. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Scripture also tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7, For God have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. 
legislative bodies across the country have declared an end to COVID-19, stating it is no longer a health emergency. However, the virus continues to wreak havoc with increasing cases in workplaces, houses of worship, restaurants, and entertainment venues. Take time to remind your children to wash their hands frequently for at least 20 seconds with hot soapy water while singing the happy birthday song twice. Provide clean masks for your kids and do not send your children to school if they are sick. Most schools require a regimen of shots before the school year starts. Consider having your child vaccinated and get the boosters if you have not already done so. Be flexible. If the past couple of years are an indicator, K through 12 graders may begin in the classroom and quickly return home to live streamed class sessions. Again, be prepared. Stay in contact with school officials via email, text message, and telephone. The prayers of the righteous availeth much along with an ounce of prevention. Let's talk a little bit about mental health. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, I'll read from the New International Version. It tells us, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We must position ourselves to support our students' mental health through prayer and supplication, and in assessing resources to help us handle those issues beyond our understanding. We must start early with getting our children into a routine of academic preparedness, which should include building up their prayer lives to face the challenges of the world. Take time to allow them to communicate about their feelings and acknowledge their concerns with a spirit of openness. Work with them to problem solve and give them the tools they need to advocate for themselves when at school. Work with their teachers, counselors, and other school administrators to address issues. Most adults do not like change. And while children are more flexible, give them time to adjust to the changes of being in new classrooms with new teachers and peers. Please understand that if your child has frequent headaches, stomach aches, sleeplessness, or any other ailment outside of their normal presentation, it may indicate a bigger problem. Get help from a school professional who can connect you to the additional community resources. Let's talk about after-school programs. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, reading from the New King James Version, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Are after-school programs important? Absolutely. They help our children bring forth the fruit of the Spirit by working with others to meet common goals while serving each other and those in their communities. In her article titled, Why Extracurriculars Are Important for Students, Patricia Sweeney states, extracurricular activities are a great way for teens to find something they're passionate about and are great opportunities for them to learn lifelong skills that will mold them into better people. Additionally, Students who spend a few hours weekly have increased brain function. They also help students with several life skills, including the following time management, 
socialization, setting goals, leadership, teamwork, public speaking, problem solving, and analytical thinking. An idle mind becomes the devil workshop. These skills gathered from extracurriculum activities build healthier families, churches, and communities. Keep your kids occupied, but also allow them to rest when needed so that their mental health doesn't suffer from overscheduling. What about social media? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 And again, I'm reading from the New King James Version, lets us know two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe unto him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. The word also says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, And I'm reading from the modern English version. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up, that it may give grace to the listeners. We all know that social media can be both a blessing and a curse. Here's the blessing. Students within school districts, cities, and states can study the same lesson and problem solve. It also allows the option of connecting with other students from across the world to share information, such as different methods that work to solve math and science problems. Social media also allows parents to crowdsource resources to support their children, especially when their children may be may have special needs or need additional tools for at-home learning. Here's the curse. In his article titled, Is Social Media Good or Bad for Students? Becton Loveless explained that too much social media has the following drawbacks. Social media can reduce the time spent on studies. The perfect life body images can lead to low self-esteem in young people through social media. Bullying has moved to an online arena, which is more difficult to track and remedy. Cases of teenage anxiety and depression are rapidly rising. There are strong links to social media being in part to blame. Social media is a 24-7 and young people can lack the maturity to switch off, leading to sleep deprivation. A reduction of physical activity is a real effect of social media. Even hanging out with friends is now commonly done over social media. We recommend that parents implement parental controls Limit the amount of time your young people spend on social media. Consider having dinner daily as a family without phones, tablets, smartwatches, and other electronic devices. Set aside a central location for all forms of media, especially cell phones, and a safe place to keep a watchful eye on your loved ones. These devices should be in a safe location outside your children's reach during bedtime hours. Teach your young ones what cyberbullying is and encourage reporting. Most importantly, watch your kids. There is no substitute for us as parents and guardians when it comes to us setting boundaries. When we leave smartphones, smart televisions, tablets, and other computing devices open and unaccounted for, we are allowing strangers to come into our homes and influence our children for better or worse. God has gifted most family with children. They are our responsibility, not the government or the school system problem, the book stops with the parents. We must take the lead educating 
and discipline our children. God told Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, and I'm reading from the contemporary English version. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is the only true God. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Memorize his laws and tell them to your children over and over again. Talk about them all the time, whether you're at home or walking along the road or going to bed at night or getting up in the morning. Write down copies and tie them to your wrist and foreheads to help you obey them. Write these laws on the door frames of your home and on your town gates. We want to see our children grow up to be successful, hardworking adults in their communities, and one day have families of their own. Our ultimate responsibility is to teach them the whole duty of man. King Solomon said in Proverbs 15:33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. Take your children to Sunday school, Bible class, and other church services. Be equally active and excited about their secular education as well as their Christian education. We must take our charges as parents and guardians seriously because when we start children off on the way that they should go and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. You'll remember that in Proverbs chapter 22, verse number six in the New International Version. Well, friends, that's all the time that we have for this episode. I hope you have enjoyed today's episode, which was produced by Associate Pastor Corey Lyndon Bellamy Sr. Be safe, stay healthy, God bless.